is Marlene Watson. I am the Director of Training at the Acumen Institute for the Family. And on behalf of the Acumen Institute for the Family, welcome to all of you. We are very excited tonight with our speaker who is very well known to the Acumen family. And now I am especially pleased to welcome Dr. Tandy Way, D. Watts Jones. I've known her for a lot of years. We've had a lot of fun at a lot of family therapy spaces. And uh, I am really excited to have her present to us tonight. Uh, Dr. Uh, Watts Jones is a family therapist, psychologist, and social worker, and a creative nonfiction writer. Also, she is a mother and grandmother, and want to make it clear that her voice and work aims to alleviate uh, the suffering caused by um, oppressive structures and by groups imposed superiority over another group. And so I am looking forward to hearing uh, what she has to say. It is my honor to present uh, Dr. Tandyway D. Watts Jones. Thank you, Ma Dr. Watson. I'm getting a little too familiar there. But uh, Marlene I'm is fine. Okay, thank you, Marlene, uh, for this invitation to speak as part of this series. Um, and welcome everyone uh, that's joining us tonight. It's given up uh, some of your precious time. Um, I am going to start um, by talking a little bit about Backtalk, which was part of the opening, uh, the title actually of this uh, presentation. So, and I'm sure there's some of you out there who know very well what Backtalk is, but for those of you uh, who may not, um, it's essentially registering displeasure in words, facial expressions, sounds, or asking why about a parental decision. Expressing outright resistance would be lost your mind back talk. In my mother's house, God was respect and back talk was disrespectful. In the deep South, black people were disrespected 24 seven, but rarely by their children. The boundary between children and grown folks was tight, easing into a more permeable one in the teen years once baseline expectations were met. When I realized uh, that authoritarian parenting was essentially patriarchal, I thought maybe I got launched on my career in mental health and healing from oppression earlier than I thought. Um, but I've come to know that my career path is my soul path, is my soul work. Uh, it's what I came here to do in this lifetime, be an instrument of healing and liberation for my people, especially, and all people. Now, though my mom's parenting was patriarchal, she was not a patriarch. She was very serious about her own career and invested in my having agency as a woman in the world. I dedicate this talk to her and to Audre Lorde, whose boldness in different ways continues to ground me in my strength and vulnerability, and to Miguel Hernandez and Scipio Small, fellow family therapy teachers and men of great commitment, love, and integrity, with whom I walked the path for many years. Tonight, I'd like to share some of the salient lessons, guideposts, and ideas that emerged in my career in community mental health, along with some of the resources that supported me. It is my hope that my offering tonight will be of some benefit to both therapists and others drawn to this talk for other reasons. Fresh from the 60s and the early 70s, I started social work school with the idea of addressing racism's emotional and relational impact in therapy. I have pursued this as a social worker, a psychologist, a family therapist, a teacher, a supervisor of family therapy, and as a womanist. Other isms came later in my awareness to, to incorporate. In social work school, I argued with Black men in the struggle who took the position that community organization and administration were the vehicles, not casework, i.e. therapy. 
I insisted that both were needed. I had a dream then of an institution in the community that would offer a range of services, therapy, advocacy for interfacing with DSS and CPS and other maze-like institutions, as well as community organizing from which people could be mobilized to political action for changes in their community and beyond. It is a dream I still hold. So let me define how I think of oppression because I will be using this word uh, quite a bit. Um, to me, oppression is the systemic use of power to dehumanize, dominate, and exploit a segment of humanity for the benefits and elevation of the oppressors. It is embedded in a way of life, flows through a multitude of channels, school curriculums and budgets, English and other languages, the quality of air, housing, drinking water in neighborhoods, churches, tenure rituals, it's in emissions, healthcare, boundaries, and trouncing of boundaries. It's in theories, definitions, on and on. It's violent swings from hundreds of small cuts on particular human lives up to those sutured, up to those that sever a body from its life. It is the soup we all swim and drown in until we don't, until we work to dissemble it and co-create truth-telling accountability, rituals, new structures for healing within and between us. Oppression is crazy making. It is rare, if ever, that those in the act of oppressing you will tell you that they are doing so. Rather, it's called something benign. Racism is not recognized as affirmative action, only the attempt to redress it. And plundering your culture, your land for riches and taking your children summarily away from you to boarding schools are acts of the civilized upon the uncivilized, the primitive. Validation of one's experience matters. Now I'd like to show you a clip, I think uh, of Billy Porter um, talking about his own experience of um, oppression. My singing voice was my ticket out of all the stuff around me that was not so good. You know, and I understood that so early and I started working on it really, really early. And I feel very blessed and lucky about that. So we have a little bit of that too, which is on your, as you say, evolution. Yes. Let's take a look. Oh, what? What you got now? Oh, shoot. And the chorus here are going to perform <laughs> We Doy. Called We Doy. Juicy Bill. The dust of my Watch Bill. I can do it. <laughs> That's my best friend, Benita. Some might say that you look sexy here, you know, in a, in a, in a way. I did it. You said, quote, butch, butch. Really, end quote. And <laughs> these conversations are happening with the internet. Maybe a kid in, in a small town might come across some of this stuff earlier than yeah. in your generation. But we all need to be having these conversations together. So yeah, we do. what does it even mean to someone when you say butch Billy then and the pressures you were under then to now? What does that mean? You know, this conversation about masculinity and the importance that's placed on us as men mm -hmm. to perform this version of masculinity that to me can sometimes be toxic, can sometimes not fit. And it's this binary that was created for the power structure. Mm -hmm. Did you think? 
Okay, bottle number one. This is my singing voice was my ticket out. Let's see how we go. And I started working on it really, really early. And I feel very blessed and lucky about that. So we have a little bit of that too, which is on your... <laughs> His best uh -huh. friend. You hear? You know, in a, in a, in a way. You said, "quote butch, butch. Really, end quote." And <laughs> these conversations are happening with the internet. Maybe a kid in in a small town might come across some of this stuff earlier than yeah. and we do what does it even mean to someone when you say butch billy then and the pressures you were under then to now what does that mean you know this conversation about masculinity and the importance that's placed on us as men mm -hmm. to perform this version of masculinity that to me can sometimes be toxic, can sometimes not fit. And it's this binary that was created for the power structure. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that maybe you were doing a double performance then? Uh, I didn't, I was so in it because I just wanted to do it right. So, you know, that was from my first record deal in 1997. It was the first time, ironically, the first time my voice, my singing voice didn't work for me was singing in the music industry. Emmy, Grammy, and two-time Tony. That's the first time Writer it didn't Writer and director. Work. How about That's very the first talented. time it didn't Billy. save Porter, me. thanks for being here. Thanks for That's having me, Artie. I'm excited to talk with you. Than the actual talent. Okay, y'all. And it was confusing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had gone to Carnegie Mellon. I had, you know, shaken all the, you know, sissy out. You know, I could do it. I was good at it. You know, and now that I go back and I look at it, the thing that hurts the most about that time is that everybody made me feel like I wasn't good at it. Mm. So when you watch- And I was. <laughs> you can see it right there. I was. So when you, I like that. When you watch that, you feel like- I was good at it. You were nailing it. I was good at being butch. I was good at being straight, pretending to be straight. I was good at nobody. Nobody would know unless you knew. Mm. For real. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it was a really interesting time. I, it was the turning point for me in when it all imploded. I was like, I need to take the reins of my life back. And it was in that moment around 99, 2000, where I thought, I have to get out of this now to save myself. I'm going to choose myself. I'm going to save myself. And whatever that means is what it means. So had you conventionally succeeded, quote unquote, in that lane more, would you then have felt you had to stay like that? Would that have been a, a part of it? So I wanted to start here to just talk about this current context that we're in. Uh, there's a poem that I want to read at the end that's called Hard Season. I don't think the poet had uh, what I'm talking about here in mind, but it certainly fits. Um, the latest hard season of backlash is really a, a collective location that we're in right now. And uh, it's been brutal to witness um, all the depravity of those who worship at the altar of power and money and domination above, above all else, no shame. It's been dispiriting, enraging, grievous to witness, especially the siphoning away of what people died for and had their heads split open for. As therapists, we've been supporting ourselves and loved ones, as well as our clients through this, and hopefully allowing ourselves to be supported. But I also think 
This painful witnessing is allowing a clarity to emerge for more people, that is, about who and where we are. So clarity number one, it's not just the looming demographics that's precipitating this, it's us. The increasing visibility, empowerment and embrace of our subjugated selves by us and some privileged folks. It's our increasing imprint on the dominant discourse and in institutions, more truth telling and the push for accountability and healing. Humanity is a mind blowing garden of all kinds of flowers. We are saying we want all of them in the garden to bloom. Would anyone be ridiculous enough to say that a sunflower is superior to a rose? We the subjugated are not as alone as before. Never have there been so many different flowers protesting together as when George Floyd was murdered. There is fruit growing from the teaching of students of all kinds about systemic oppression of women, the disabled, BIPOC, Jewish people, immigrants of color, the poor, its roots in exploitation and genocide. We have been teaching that what you do with your privilege matters. Our stories are being told, words in the air and on paper, cisgender, non-binary, whiteness, and twin spirit, words like water protectors, Black Lives Matter, I live on the unceded land of the Lenape. Society's vocabulary is expanding. Still we die, still we live and rise. These are just a few of the things that I'm aware of. I know that there's many more going on, but I just wanna mention uh, urban farms that are being created uh, by black folks to feed our communities and teach skills to young people the increasing development of social justice models of therapy, healthcare, somatic abolitionism, culture building and political organizing. The increasing visibility of BIPOC, queer and LGBT artists and their work. The New York state law that created a special prosecutor in the attorney general's office to review all cases of citizens killed at the hands of the police. They, will prosecute the case, the special prosecutor, instead of the local DA, if it is deemed chargeable. Women getting people registered and out to vote and more. I just wanna say that um, I, the only way that I think we can survive in this hard season is that we have to both be aware of and feel and, and deal with all of the ugliness and, but also keep in mind all of the beauty and all of the work that people are doing. And so I was very moved um, because the black community has been very um, slow um, in embracing uh, the LGBTQ uh, community and that, to have it, them raise this challenge and, and they have a trans daughter and I'm sure that's a big part of it, but to, for them to bring that, that challenge to the NA, ACP um, and all the people there, I thought was really big. That that's one of the things that um, that that holds that can hold us. I think. Now we have uh, clarity number two, and you can see here is the breakdown of the 2020 voting, um, and 58% uh, of whites voted for the incumbent. This is after seeing four years of that incumbent, 58% of them still voted. And 61% of white men voted uh, for the incumbent and 55% of white women. I'm really not sure that the 34%, the 32%, the and the 27% are really statistically significant, um, but I mean, different. Um, but you can see it is still, I say a, a significant drop from 58% of whites that we have 34% of Asians voted, 32% of Latinx, 27% of LGBT. Um, and then, you know, we have black folks who are like, I think another notch down who are, who are very clear that they're not 
going to vote, did not vote for the incumbent. Um, and then the 44% of those with income less than 50,000 voted and 54% of those with income of 100,000 more. So, so, I mean, who knows what's gonna happen if, if you know, the incumbent is still around or some other facsimile in 2024, but it was shock, it's, it's still shocking to me. Um, and, and, you know, I know we shouldn't be shocked, but it's just, it's still shocking. In the clarity three, and, and I say in questions, because I don't, I don't really have, you know, a particular answer beyond what I say here, but I, I think it's, it's increasingly clear to me that, you know, it's going to take a massive joining of us across our social locations um, to dissipate from this land some of the toxics that are spilled and still spilling in every living thing. A joining of conscious, privileged, and subjugated alike as an array of humanity's garden. And by that, I don't mean that we blend and blur and bleed into each other. I think the whole point of liberation, or at least one of the points of liberation, is that everybody can be seen as um, worthwhile and having their own distinct beauty and loveliness. Uh, and I think too often in the past, what can happen is when we join across these subjugated and privileged positions, some of that old stuff comes out where people don't want to share power. Uh, I mean, this is typically the thing. And so it's a huge thing to get to a place where uh, people who are privileged are of the mentality that they understand the importance of sharing power, both in planning and execution and the goals. Beyond that, I cannot say. Uh, I wanna say a little bit about where I live in terms of my own social locations. I'm black, African-American, black Caribbean, cisgender, heterosexual, female. I live in that kind of body that I just named. I'm mostly able, a mother of two, uh, an elder, a Grammy of one. I live in that kind of body. <laughs> a second generation middle class with a spiritual practice that draws on elements of indigenous uh, spiritual traditions of the Yoruba and Dagara people of West Africa, Native Americans and of Buddhism. I am open to a deeper healing and to being a vessel for that journey in others and to them being a vessel for my journey. And I just wanna say quickly, uh, you know, that I, I, when I wrote that, I was like, oh yeah, that's gonna sound, oh, that's gonna sound a little off because we're not supposed to, it's supposed to be all about the client. Um, and so the idea that the client may be doing something for us is kind of like looked askance at. But I guess from my point of view, I believe that we are in people's lives for a reason. And I believe that each person that comes before me or each couple or family or whatever, that we are there for some kind of uh, mutual learning. Uh, that, that That's just my spiritual. Uh, understanding. And so at the end of every session, when people thank me, I thank them because, and I mean it. Um, and then I guess the other thing I'll say is that I, I live in the, in the magic of spirit, both capital and small. Um, and that essentially for me means I am receptive to the messages and support that comes through many vessels. My privileged and subjugated identities shape each other, but do not offset. I really want to make this point. And it, lately, as I've been actually writing and thinking about intersectionality more, it's come to me that there's some more stuff, some more work we need to do about really understanding intersectionality, um, like the nuances of it. This is only a small little part of it. I haven't even been able to articulate it at, at this point. But what I want to make clear here is that while my middle-class heterosexual cisgender privilege cushions my black female world in some ways that I may hardly notice, except, you know, cash flow. You kind of notice when you have, you know, a decent cash flow. Um, there are ways, you know, they cushion in ways that are not available to black females or males of lower working class income or LGBT and gender fluid people. But these privileges do not offset being black. Uh, I live most consciously in my subjugated worlds, but that does not offset my indoctrination into classism. 
heteronormativity, cisgender normativity. My classism is shaped by my fierce love for my working class grandparents, but it's not dissolved. Um, we all have work to do. I wanna read a poem now, get my hands on it. It's one of my favorite poems. It's written by uh, a Palestinian American uh, woman, Naomi Shihab Nye. Uh, it's called Kindness. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak it you must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Only then, I don't, I'm missing the last page. Um, no, I'm not. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. It's such a beautiful sentiment. I, you know, it, it, it just touches us with the goodness in the world. Um, and the idea that if we all have suffered immensely and, and, and seeing how much suffering there is in the world, the idea that kindness could just become a way of life is one that I resonate with um, on, on, in terms of sort of the higher plane level of my visions. But here on the daily ground, this is the reason I'm, I'm saying this poem, here on the daily ground, I do not see kindness as a strategy in and of itself for dismantling oppression. One can be a kind and good person most of the time and still be mindless about one's own implicit and explicit notions of their superiority or inferiority and through inaction collude with them. And I make this point because there's still a, you know, a lot of confusion about you know, if you're a good person, that means you, know, you don't have anything to do with racism or patriarchy or, or all of that. And kindness, this is my position. You don't have to own it with me, but I don't think by itself, it will help us dis dismantle oppression. If it leads to other actions in that direction, that's a different story. So, this is what, and this turned out to be the major theme actually of everything I'm, I'm gonna present and that is create and persist. I just wrote Kuwumba up there because that's a principle of Kwanzaa that you know, I celebrate, my family celebrates, uh, which is creativity. It's, it's one of the seven principles that we try to live by. Creation is powerful and transformative for the creator, the material and the beholder participant. And I know that pockets of creation are at work and play and rest everywhere in the service of healing, equity, empowerment, and love. I know many of you have and are creating vehicles for this in therapy and in other domains, and I thank you. And I want to encourage more to do so. In my career, creating has been a major resource to me, to my sense of agency and to my energy for the struggle. 
it has also created resource. The first thing um, I would say in terms of my career, creating a collective is, is almost number one, um, especially when you're in an institution, especially again, if you're coming at this from the point of view of social justice and you're in an institution um, that is not very far along uh, in that. And so you really, to create a collective with those who share your goals. And, and if you can do that in, that in the institution where you work or in the school, it's, it's been, it's been a, a really big asset in, in all of my career. It, from, if you move from the individual to an organization, it increases your power in the institution, especially if named and action is taken. Going from the individual to the collective increases the support and creativity available to you as well. When three family therapists of color became the faculty of color, we became a force. This is a second um, creation that I think is really important. And I think um, Nowadays, there's a lot more energy around this, the, the importance of creating spaces for privileging your subjugated self in the form of rest from warriorship or activism, if, if you prefer. Uh, sometimes I would take a rest from talking to people who didn't wanna hear what I wanted to say. Uh, and that is certainly privileging my subjugated self because clearly that will not be an ongoing strategy for liberation, only talking to people who wanna hear what you have to say. But it is, you know, there is this thing about, it, it's like an ongoing walking uphill when you're talking to people who really don't wanna hear what you have to say. Uh, and it's oftentimes you, you have to go there, but it's such a pleasure to, to offset that with just for a period of time, just talking to people who, welcome what you have to say. Um, and, um, and also the other thing about that is, this is where sometimes attention builds between people is that when you gotta go back and, and have these debates about like getting to step one or two with people, necessary, yes, but there's a way in which it, it also drains you because you really wanna be talking to people who are already at step eight or nine so that you can kind of go now more. Obviously both these things are necessary, but I think sometimes in, in classes, this in, can end up being a problem and people who are at, at the A step can sometimes be resentful because they feel like they're, they're going back. I, I, was in a, I was in a class once, a writing class, and um, there were, it was predominantly white, but there were some people of color there. And, and the person, actually one of the sisters got up and said, you know, one of the teach, black teachers had mentioned this notion of Afro pessimism. I still don't know. I still haven't really found out what it is, but not, nobody had heard of it, but we hardly got a chance to explore it because the, they were focused on the, the kinds of questions that most of the other people. So it's just something to keep in mind, I think sometimes in terms of learning context. Um, we have the advent of the NAP ministry created by Tricia Hersey. That and the and this quote rest is resistance, which I love. The whole idea that in resting our bodies, we are doing something that was never envisioned for our bodies, uh, and in that way, sometimes people say rest is radical. Here's a notion, and I think it's pertinent to this uh, because you know we want to give, we want to you know contribute, and all that. And this is something I learned from working with a, a father and son. And that is that receiving is as sacred as giving. It's a part of a cycle of exchange that requires both. That in order for someone to give, really someone has to receive. You know, you don't get the pleasure of giving without somebody receiving you. And unfortunately, um, this is such a dualistic society. It's not located just in... Um, in the United States, this is also in Europe. Um, but, you know, we always looking for, okay, no, this one is better than this one. And I, I get really tired of, you know, giving is such a, you know, you're a better human being if you're giving all the time, if you're selfless and all this. But the truth is when you're giving, you're also getting something 
you're getting the pleasure of giving. I mean, this is assuming, of course, that your, your giving is sacred, you know, uh, and not something else. But I think it's an important thing. It, it was very profound for me to realize that. And I think it's something that we can remember, you know, sometimes when we're feeling like we're not giving enough. Um, Y'all can see I'm not all that tech savvy. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about really one of the major forms of um, creative creativity that I have engaged in in my career, which is journal articles, writing journal articles. It's, it's, it's been one of my primary back talks um, in the sense of critiquing oppressive ideology and assumptions and practices, fostering healing and addressing the void in recognizing race as a substantive factor in clinical theory and practice. Sometimes the writing is backtalk, not just in a general way, but to a very specific experience, which was true for my first one. Um, the title was African-American Clients, Clinical Practice Issues. And in writing it, it was backtalk also to my Black so social work supervisor who would not let me refer to our clients as African-Americans in my notes. And it was also backtalk to all the social workers whose notes uh, that I read labeled our medical clients, which were primarily black, as dull, concrete, dependent, unable to delay gratification, and having poor impulse control. It's an example of uh, really another major strategy of mine, which is uh, I refer to as dedicate the rage or setback. Um, it's really important, I think, not to let the fuel of rage go into something destructive because uh, that happens far too often. Um, and many of the black clients I, I work with, I see a, a lot of it is how to handle the rage of what's happening um, at their jobs uh, a great deal of the time. Um, it's really a powerful energy. And if we put it to constructive use, it can work for us. And so that's been one of the things that I've tried to uh, be mindful of. This is a quote from Bell Hooks. When our lived experience of theorizing is fundamentally linked to processes of self-recovery, of collective liberation, no gap exists between theory and practice. Theory is not inherently healing, liberatory, or revolutionary. It fulfills this function only when we ask that it do so and direct our theorizing to this end. And it's taken from teaching to, transgress, teaching to transgress. I'm not sure why I never thought of myself as theorizing. Perhaps it's that I tend to think of theory as formal, complex, and abstract, as in esoteric, but the first time I thought of some of my work as theory making was after a well-known family therapist and journal editor referred to it in those terms. But any moving from the concrete to generality is abstracting. Any conceptualization that captures an essential quality or meaning of concrete phenomena, poetry, for example. Bell Hook's words may also help explain why I didn't conceive of some of my writing as theory making, perhaps because my work my thinking was focused on healing and liberation. Perhaps because of that, there was no gap between theory and practice. And the search for practice was preeminent for me. I'm always trying to think about what, what can we do? And I'm also thinking about and, and how are we informed about that? So I got this picture. Uh, this is about the makings of an, of an article on healing internalized racism, the role of a within group sanctuary. And it's about black people in shame. And um, I thought this tree with all these roots was a good, um, it was a good metaphor for how deep I think the roots of shame are. Uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, from the motherland on. I wanna share my underlying thinking to demystify the process of this theory making. 
It began with a guest speaker at a faculty meeting who presented on shame, saying it occurs when, on, when one's entire being is deemed defective, inadequate, or bad, as opposed to a particular behavior being bad or inadequate. For the first time, I thought of oppression as a collective comprehensive shaming of African people and their descendants. Beyond the shameful step and fetch it or other early representations of black folk as dumb and fully abiding their subservience, which evoked shame in us. At this period of time, some black females had begun to break the boundary that kept talk of black nappy hair and colorism among black people. Colorism is the internalized shame about dark skin, which is worldwide, not just black people. That seemed noteworthy to me that that was happening. And I wondered what allowed for that change. <clears throat> I read books on shame and found different conceptions, including some that contradicted the one of the speaker. Um, I thought of these actions, that is the black power uh, and the black is beautiful. I, I thought of them as challenging uh, what I consider to be the primary shame. You know, and I had not thought of shame in that way. I had not thought that, that in fact, and you can conceptualize oppression in many ways, but I had not never thought about, yeah, we have been shamed. Like that is embedded, that is part of oppression. And the primary shame is enslavement and white supremacy. Acknowledging that we have indeed internalized it to varying degrees was a secondary shame, I thought. And you never air your vulnerability to shame to your oppressor. While in your own community, you make up rhymes about colorism and know you feel embarrassed or ashamed if rain touches your hair. It was reasoning or theory posing from my lived experience combined with other information I had access to. The word sanctuary in the article's title came from a lynching exhibit I'd gone to entitled Without Sanctuary. We need sanctuary, I thought. One does not need to be a Rhodes Scholar which you may be to do this. Theory making is not limited to the purview of so identified brilliant minds, so you may have one. Nor does one have to be a professor. My grandfather did not graduate elementary school and I know he had theories on how he and his family would do more than survive. I exist today because of all of the theory making, trial and retrial carried out by my enslaved ancestors, at least in part. And Bell Hooks, with her unquestionably brilliant mind, argued mightily against feminist and other academic writing that could not be understood by students and everyday people because of its abstract removal from their lives and or dense presentation. Too often, theory writing that is dense or highly abstract is considered superior to simpler, clearer ones. I reject this, and sometimes the density is just poor writing. I want to encourage us, especially, and, and it isn't just the subjugated. I mean, I always go to the subjugated first, right? But um, to, to do more theory making from our lived experiences. And it's also the privilege because as you, if you are doing your work and trying to um, change how you deal with your privilege, if you're doing your work in terms of trying to um, shift out of all the ways in which superiority has been um, subtly inbred in you, it's, it's so helpful. It's so helpful to write and share about that. So it's not just the people with the subjugated identities that I'm, I'm encouraging. I'm really encouraging anybody who's doing work in this area, whether from the subjugated or the privileged side, to, to really consider um, writing about it, writing in terms of theory making, because I think we don't often think about theory making as I don't, didn't. Um, I sought to do a workshop for black therapists to address the issue of shame among us. I was told yes, no, sort of. And when my colleagues of color and I wanted to offer a mentoring group for the trainees of color who wanted one, the initial response was mixed. The positive came from a faculty member also working with the trainees of color. 
the administrative response was that we were polarizing. We persisted, even when another source said we were engaging in segregation. This and how Bowen's theory of differentiation helped us through this, this change as detailed in that article I handed out um, about the mentoring group. I, we, I go over that, so I'm not going further with that. Even with the support of my family of color colleagues, there were times when I wished I could be seen as more than a bad guy slash woman, someone to undermine, diminish in subtle and not so subtle ways. This wish surprised me because I knew not to expect it, but I wish for welcoming nonetheless, not like wonderful hugs as I learned in the Gara rituals, but a desire and appreciation for what I was trying to bring. But I learned to be okay with that feeling. There are costs to challenging institutional policy and practice, especially around race. And mine were molecular compared to what others have paid. I share this only to normalize that we who press can be tough and vulnerable, and that's just fine. The important thing here is, is about the persisting. Irritant. In a conversation with a woman I just met, her name is Sindiway, Sindiway. She dropped the word irritant as a description of how she'd been feeling in her work context and why she was ready to go back to South Africa. That metaphor reached me in a profound way, like a deep dropping of my shoulders. I was an irritant, no doubt. And of course, there was irritation. It just somehow allowed me to, to relax into, again, that same reality that I was wishing that people would, you know, at least think, see that I'm trying to bring something good. You know, I mean, it goes with the territory. It just had a, it's interesting how sometimes metaphor can actually reach you in a way that just, you know, your logical mind doesn't. Um, and so I ended up writing an article about the need for within group space, which was back talk to the resistance I anticipated from the wider family therapy field. Uh, concerns that, I, I, that they would have about reverse discrimination. I should have quotes around that uh, and or anxiety provoking to whites. Today, such space is not such a radical notion among family therapists and its use is not limited to subjugated populations or healing internalized racism. It is also a resource um, for examining privilege and superiority. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat you to this uh, amazing poet. Uh, I, some of you may have, uh, may know her or not, but Patricia Smith. The poem is All Purpose Product. What surfaces can I use this product on? Answer. Lysol may be used on hard, non-porous surfaces throughout your home. Lysol cleans, disinfects, and deodorizes regular and non-wax floors, non-wood cabinets, sinks, and garbage pails. For painted surfaces, it re recommended that the product first be tested in a small, inconspicuous area. Can Lysol be used in the kitchen? Answer. Lysol may be used on countertops, refrigerators, non-wood cabinets, sinks, stovetops, and microwave ovens. For the bathroom, it may be used for tiles, tubs, sinks, and porcelain. And for all around the house, it may be used on floors, garbage cans, in the basement, and in the garage. Can I use this inside my refrigerator? Answer, Lysol may be used on the inside of a refrigerator. However, you must remove all food and rinse well after using the product. Can I use this to kill mold and mildew? Yes. Lysol controls the growth of mold and mildew. It kills the mold, but removal of the stain associated with mold and mildew can sometimes be tough. Can I use this to scrub the uncontrollable black from the surface of my daughter to make her less Negro and somehow less embarrassing to me? She's like the hour after midnight that child is. Why? Yes. Begin with one Sears Gray Swirl Dinette Set Cheer screeching across the hardwood on spindly steeled legs. 
place the offending child on the ruptured plastic of the seat. Demand that she bend her neck to grant you access to the damaged area. You know, of course, that black begins at the back of the neck. Grab a kitchen towel, a washcloth, or sponge, and soak with undiluted Lysol concentrate. Ignoring the howls of the impossibly Negro child, scrub vigorously until the offending Black surrenders. There may be inflammation, a painful rebellion of skin, and slight bleeding. This is simply the first step to righteousness. The child must be punished for her lack of silky tresses her broad sinful nose, that dark negroid blanket she wears, layers of her must disappear. Precautionary statements, danger, corrosive to eyes and skin, harmful if swallowed, causes eye and skin damage. Do not get in eyes or on skin. Wear protective eyewear and rubber gloves when handling. Woman, your mission is beyond this. You must clean the child, burn the southern sun, if she squirms from the hurting, demand that she hold on to the sides of the chair. Soak towel or sponge with our patented holy water. Repeat application. I have tried to understand. Precautionary statements. My mother. Danger. Her hatred of this. Corrosive the eyes and skin of the me that wears this. Harmful of swallowed. The monster she had. Causes eye and skin damage. The monster she wanted. Do not get in eyes or on skin. Mama, can't you read it? You want me to read it to you? I can't help being my color. I am black. I am not dirty. I am black. I am not dirty. I am black. I am not dirty. What you have birthed upon me will not come off. My hair is black crinkled steel, too short to stay flatted. My ass is wide and will get wider. You can pinch my nose, but it will remain a landscape. You cannot reverse me. What is filthy to you will never be cleansed. There is only one thing you can change. I am not dirty, I am black. I am not dirty, I am black. I am not black, I am dirty. I am dirty black, not black. I am black and dirty. Dirt is black, black is dirty. You convinced me that I am what is wrong in this world. Scrub me right. Bleed me. I apologize, y'all. I services. Can I use this product? No, we're not going through this again. Let me just see if I can get the tail. Forgive me, Patricia Smith. <laughs> Let's see if I can get you to this point. Five. Oh yes, yes, yes. Four, we have to have the ending. I forgot about that. Eight. Okay, hold on. Two. Leave sanitation in 30 seconds. 29, 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two. Done. Yeah, that's a very powerful um, rendition about Black and Shane. Um, I just want to quickly recommend this book. It's one of my favorite children's books, Soul Way. Um, and I, I recommend it to any kind of parent, whether you're Black, white, whatever. Um, 
because it's an amazing book. It was written by Lupita Nyong'o, who's you know well-known actress who has very dark skin. Um, and um, that it, and it, what I love about this book is that it really tackles it the issue of shame of, of black skin in the context of dark and light, which any of you who spend any time with me know I have a thing about that. Um, but you know, the, the rampant metaphorical use of dark and light to me is another dualism that uh, light is it, light and white over dark being black, night, evil, depressing, all of that. And they actually deal with this in the book and it's so beautifully written and it's so beautifully illustrated. The characters are female and I recommend it for children of all gender identities. So Location of Self is another article I, um, I wrote. I'm just gonna say a couple of things about it because I really do wanna hit some other main points. But the main thing about this um, was that I, it's a practice that I initially encountered in working with Miguel. Um, but I ended up uh, expanding it and developing it into a fuller framework, which essentially is about introducing social locations, both the privileged uh, and the subjugated ones as pertinent to therapy and the therapeutic relationship. Um, and uh, having it be a foundational uh, dialogue, um, I tend to do it as part of the, when I get to the treatment planning phase as part of that. Uh, and, and talking about you know, who we are in the room, I totally if, don't believe that we show up there just with our theories. Uh, we show up there as human beings with all kinds of locations and, and things that we, um, things we know, things we don't know. Uh, the questions that we ask are not just based on our theories. Um, they're based on what we know, what some of the assumptions are. Um, and it also basically uh, is a forerunner for introducing, addressing oppression as part of therapy. Now, the themes of oppression, uh, and this was originally compiled by myself and two colleagues, uh, Julia Chan and Aquila Frederick, uh, when we were doing um, Healing the Oppressive Legacies Project. Um, which was 2016 to 19. Um, it's essentially what is a compilation of what uh, I listen for um, in terms of as markers of oppression or superiority or devaluation, inferiority. Um, I uh, revised it recently for this talk. I added some things and and reworded some things, um, but it's it's useful because it's like, and so you'll see something, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but you'll see something like uh, depression, uh, despair. You'll see things that affective things that you might say, well, heck, you know, that could be about anything. That's right, it can be about anything. But what I'm thinking about is. I'm putting in the mix, it could be about oppression too. So I'm going to query, right? If, when I start hearing, um, like I'm down, I feel, you know, inadequate. I feel like, you know, I'm not attractive, right? To me, I know those are themes that have been shamed. I'm talking about among the subjugated. Um, and so what markers do, it doesn't mean that everybody has the experience, but these are, but these are, Themes meaning they tend to occur and they tend to reflect the, um, the marking of oppression, the mark of oppression. Uh, and it just helps uh, you to be able to, to get into that material because it, you know people don't always know. You know that's a whole part of like wanting to identify is, is to bring, and this comes later and maybe I won't get to it, I'll just say it now, like, the whole idea of, you know, how do you get to feel that you're not attractive? Well, because I have a belly or, you know, my skin and all that. Well, it's funny how we lose the connection between where that came from. You know, we're just depressed and we're just ugly, you know, or we just are not smart enough or whatever, right? It becomes our personal marker. And part of what 
you know, I, I'm interested in doing and those of us, you know, doing this work um, and, and we don't all do it in the same way, but is to, is to get the link between that experience and where that came from. Because, and, and, and a lot of times it came initially from the family, right? The family has, you know, taken this in as well. And they also are victims of it. And so you keep going back and often you will take it right back to oppression. You know, you'll take it back to enslavement when light-skinned people were in the house, like those who were enslaved, the light-skinned were in the house and those that were dark-skinned were in the field. So anyway, um, it's just, I find it very useful. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk, ah, no. <laughs> I wanted to talk about this, this white people in shame. I've talked a little bit about uh, black people in shame. Um, this, this first comment up here is, on, is in the, the uh, themes of oppression. It isn't helpful to shame people. Um, this is a comment I began to hear after introducing location of self. It registered almost immediately as signaling anxiety and as a red or yellow light about raising the issue of racial and other oppression with white clients in therapy. I doubt that the people who offered this were even aware of it either, but I could think of so many other responses that could have come out of this anxiety if it could have been owned instead of shifting the focus to those raising this issue, alluding to them as shaming people. And this phrase lives, I, I hear it, you know, I hear it even now. Um, the history of enslavement and genocide and land theft is indeed shameful. If white people feel shame about their ancestral legacy when it is brought up, that is not the same to me as shaming them. It is conceivable that no matter how it is raised, feelings of shame may arise in white people. In raising this legacy and its reach into the present, we are trying to raise awareness and enlist white people in the possibilities of reckoning with this past and the present. It's implicit and explicit infusion in their lives as in all of our lives. We're trying to recognize help them recognize the privilege bestowed to them and the choice they have to act internally and externally to change the legacy that will go forward to the next generation. If there is no distinction between shaming and raising a shameful legacy past and present, then we are silenced to the status quo. Further subjugation. I am glad to see that Ackerman has recently offered a workshop to assist whites in handling feelings of shame. It moves the needle to offer it and to have white people interested in participating in it. When I hear white parents say they are against curriculum for their children that tells the truth of history, and here I'm not talking about, you know, the MAGA people. I'm talking about people who probably consider themselves liberal or moderates. Um, when I hear them, uh, say that they don't, they don't, they're against these, these truth-telling uh, history curriculums and maybe social studies um, because they don't want their children to feel bad about themselves. One of the ways that I make sense of this, I mean, beside the fact that, you know, well, anyway, I'm not even gonna say that because the next video is gonna address that. Um, I think how I'm understanding that is that they have not, these parents have not been able to themselves integrate this truth into themselves in a way that they can hold. Because it seems to me, if they have done the work of reckoning with this history, this truth, then they would have confidence in their ability to help their kids deal with it. But I think that may be a big part of it. And I think um, that it, it really could be a place for more innovative clinical work, right? Like, like the work when helping white people deal with shame, like helping white parents who have this fear, who I, I think, this is a hypothesis, you know, maybe it holds no water, but hey, it's worth, I think, looking into um, because maybe that may be a place that we can help. I don't know how we can heal as a nation if only black, indigenous, and people of color are left to the reckoning as we always have been except for the white abolitionists and civil rights protesters. 
It leaves us without any shared pain of what has been transpiring. That leaves us without collective truth telling, accountability, and healing. Only the fakery of the way we live, the festering, the repetition. I want to show this next clip. It's really short, but I think it really, this is one of my beloved mentors, his poem. Everyone knows the image of the Sherpa who hauls the tools and supplies for the leader of the expedition. How this leader will be white, the Sherpa dark, an Englishman and a Tibetan, the one known, the other anonymous, the one lightened a burden, the other bearing the burden of both. Yes, we understand this job in its physical sense. But what does it mean to serve as a psychic Sherpa? to carry the unpleasant emotions and memories of another, for one person to be weighted down by darkness, depression, madness, so the other may be lighter, happier, and sane. Do people of color carry in our psyches the memories of burdens of our mutual history so that whites can live in amnesia without the burdens such memories entail? Do we take in realities whites do not have to see and thus take up? And how does all this affect the mental energies we must put out in order to function in our lives? Separate, unequal, the realities, the histories we carry. Everyone knows the image of the shirt. So I am going to, I already talked a bit about this naming um, and I wanna say a little bit more. I'm, I'm gonna drop out um, what I have in here about working with the subjugated. Um, I wanna say something about the process of working with uh, whites um, in, uh, in therapy around this. Um, it's been really interesting to me to reflect on. So again, I'm into the naming, which is what Judith Herman uh, in her trauma work talks about. I don't know, I don't recall if she's really into it also for the issue of, of identifying that it's part, that it's systematic. I just don't remember, but that is certainly part of my, uh, the value for me is that I think it's important for people to understand this is not simply a, a premise. This is, this is a whole coordinated institution that's systematic. It's, it's actually multiple institutions. And the reason I think that's important, particularly, I mean, it can be important for both, but I, I start out with the subjugated because it's, when, you, when you're carrying these, these feelings of, of, of not being good enough and all of that, it's, it's really important for you to know where it comes from and that also, um, that it's, it's, it's challenging, you know, you, you're up against something really big. And so I think what it does, it allows people to, to, to understand, um, that this is not just some, you know, personal inadequacy that you, uh, that you have succumbed to, uh, and that if you're going to reclaim yourself, I love that part, you know, where Billy Porter says, um, you know, I'm just gonna have to, I'm gonna have to claim myself. I'm just gonna have to be myself. I'm gonna have to be who I am and what I came here to do. And um, and that if that's the direction we're going, which is what, you know, I'm hoping that that's where we're going, then, you know, it, it's a piece of work and you're gonna need, you're gonna need people. I mean, I think we know that the whole collective is a very powerful uh, resource, you know, the collective and the community. Um, that you're going to you're going to need a lot of other resources to do this. You know what you're dealing with, and I always think you're better off when you know what you're dealing with. So um, I just want to talk about how I use name it in terms of the this. So I want to. It's interesting. I, I will use the terms white supremacy or specific isms during the whole LO, uh, location of self dialogue. At that point, I'm speaking generally. And I do it across all different locations. That's when I'm talking about, you know, why I'm bringing it up. 
um, why I'm bringing up my social locations, why I'm interested in hearing about yours. And um, in ongoing therapy, I will also name a particular oppression routinely with clients who are racially subjugated and some other subjugated locations. Let me say this again, because I think I went too fast. I will also name a particular oppression routinely with clients who are racially subjugated and some other subjugated locations. And that depends on where they are with their whiteness. <clears throat> and when clients introduce these terms as part of the presenting problem, <laughs> which is rare. It was rare for white people to ever be done uh, with that. Or later, if they come to bring this up and use those terms. But in reflecting on my work, you know, for this talk, I realized that I don't tend to name the ism when I am in the midst of querying a behavior or assumption that I think reflects white privilege or superiority. I may say after querying a dehumanizing remark about a security guard in a public office who failed their expectation that I think this assumption is a reflection of your privilege. Or I may say, I think it's important for you to think about the way you are using your power as a white male attorney, aligning with your son who is in need of accountability and disempowering your wife's voice as a Thai parent who works part time. Or I might say, characterizing your, your wife's response as lacking intelligence, white male to black female, is elevating yourself as superior to her. And so it was interesting for me to actually see that, because I don't think I was conscious of doing that. But I think, and I will, you know, later on, you know, when there's a wider discussion, if there is one, um, I will go back to using the ism. But I think what this uh, says to me is that, and it makes sense to me that in the moment when I am um, addressing a particular behavior or thought or assumption that I don't use that ism word, that I use other words. And sometimes, you know, I've had, you know, the, the person that I'm um, talking about there about the uh, security guard, even the word privilege can be um, uh, upsetting to hear. Uh, by some people, but I, it's just that it, I think it makes it easier and, and it's not easy for, you know, sometimes it, it can be, sometimes it gets, it gets held in a way that's not a big, you know, inflammatory thing for people. And sometimes it's harder, um, but it just is, it's useful for me to make aware of that. I want to say that um, although the idea of teaching clients has become disfavored in recent years, I find myself recently thinking about the benefits of a social cultural education group, like similar to what Ria Almeida has in her cultural context model, um, which basically uses media and, um, and conversation to, to have people uh, deepen their awareness and consciousness about uh, privilege and how it shows up, male privilege, class privilege, it's, it's, it's helping people become aware. It, it, I think it's probably akin in some ways to what consciousness raising was you know, for the feminists uh, earlier on. And I think because when, I, I feel like when you're dealing with a very rigid um, <clears throat> position um, or the gap between the parties, the subjugated and the privileged is, is, is big in terms of how they understand uh, racism, it's just, it seems like too much to take on singularly in the therapy. It seems like this adjunctive process is really would be very useful there. Also the same for men's groups like, like Connect and Harlem, like they engage men and, and do some really amazing work. And I really wish that we get more people trained um, to deliver that kind of service. So let's see where I am in time, okay. I am just going to say a little bit about um, not doing that and not doing that. Uh, just a couple of things and then the poem and I'll be done. I just wanna say growing edges, things I'm thinking about lately. I'm like racism and internalized racism's role in the tension and animosity and alienation between people of color. The idea of art as healing. I really do believe that art is healing. 
Uh, it is definitely one of the resources that I relied on during the pandemic and this corruption uh, of care. I was keeping my eye on all the different black art going on around the city. And um, it, it made me, it just, I felt like Gosh, uh, so many other people are doing this work. They're, they're, their art is being used to represent a lot of my experience. And it's done in a way that, in different ways, but it's, it just was so affirming. Um, and I actually, for a couple of people, I don't know if, if this is going anywhere, you know, too much further, but began to suggest art as a therapeutic resource uh, with some of my clients. So here's the uh, here's the finale, y'all. Um, thank you for bearing with me in all my <laughs> slide <laughs> misadventures. Um, this is that poem I referred to earlier, The Hard Season by Nayira Wahid. The hard season will split you through. Do not worry. You will bleed water. Do not worry. This is grief. Your face will fall out and down your skin and there will be scorching, but do not worry. Keep speaking the years from their hiding places. Keep coughing up smoke from all the deaths you have died. Keep the rage tender because the soft season will come. It will come loud, ready, gulping, both hands in your chest up all night, up all of the nights, to drink all damage into love. Thank you. Do I need to come back? Do I need to, what do I need to do? <laughs> Marlene, you're muted. Um, Sandy, wait, you can stop sharing your screen. Yes. Uh, okay. So we can see you. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Um, um, I, I never thought of your articles as uh, a way of talking back, uh, but that makes perfect sense to me uh, as I followed all the articles that you've done. So that's um, uh, was revelatory for me, uh, interesting, uh, in terms of how we talk back. Um, we have a question here that I will read. Oh, well, it, it's really a comment. Uh, this has been a beautiful talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any uh, questions for a Tandy way? Okay. Uh, would you please discuss how you help clients find access, uh, find, I guess, and access hope during uh, these very uncivil times? Well, um, it's similar to what I said uh, earlier. Part of it is, number one, I, I think it's important to validate, you know, that it is painful. You know, and I don't work like, oh, it's just you who's feeling the pain. You know, that's, I say it is painful. I, I, I'm in it as well. Um, and I think it is not new. This is another thing to have some historical perspective, which is not meant to diminish the pain of the present. Um, but like we are part, like we're not here like, like separate from a whole history. We are connected to a chain of human beings, uh, and I'm very, um, you know, mindful of this as an African American, you know. Um, but it's true for all of us, and so it, we are part of the journey, and this is where we are, and this is where people have been. We have gone forward, and we have gone back, but we keep going, and so you you have to have. Um, that perspective is funny. I, I go to sometimes, uh, there's a brother, Lama Rod, um, who does uh, uh, meditation and he does some other Sangha meetings, but he was talking about how, you know, he gets a little tired of people who 
like want to give up and all that. And he was like saying that isn't in my, you know, genes, you know, there's no such thing. You know, I know I'm a part of this and it's part of the struggle and so forth. So context, historical context is part, you got to realize that. Um, and then it's like all the, all the efforts that are being made, what I was saying, you know, like all the, all the good that's going on, that so many people are working on this, even in this madness. And we can't see them all, but I think it's, this is how the art came in for me, like going to see what, what different artists are putting out here. Like it just, it just holds me up. And so I, I've actually, for a couple of people, you know, suggested some, some things for them. So those are the main things, you know, um, for me that I, that I, uh, the way that I try to approach it. Um, and I'm assuming that you, I don't know. I mean, I wish you would identify yourselves a little bit. I, I actually have not had anybody white say, you know, anything to me about this. And I'm trying to think of the clients I've had. Well, I, yeah, no, nah, yeah. So I'm just talking to you about other people of color or other people, you know, who are subjugated. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, so helpful in instigating thoughts regarding my own experience and various roles that might be described as an intersectional experience. So another thank you, basically. Thank you. I, I did want to add while you're waiting to see if there's another question, I, I left out that even though I spent a lot, I spent time talking about writing articles and stuff like that, there's just so many different ways of using your voice and your mind and your body that can contribute and that are creative. And I don't by any means want to um, give short shrift to other ways of doing it. I would say though, I will still put a little plug in that even if you develop certain creative practices, um, like the, the thing about writing at some point, consider writing about it because the thing about writing is that it just gets a, a wider audience. Um, although, you know, you can get to be known using your voice too. I mean, look at Billy Porter and all, a lot of other people. So I just, I didn't want to leave the impression that I was saying only writing journal articles. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Um, so I'll read the entire uh, piece. You finish with the notion of love as it concludes the last poem you read. How does a philosophy of love, which I view as a major contribution of African-American thought and art to the world, enter your therapeutic work and even the work of Beck Talk? Yeah, you know, that's it's an interesting thing because I've been thinking about uh, a lot lately, like why do we not talk about love in, in all our clinical you know, theories, and I got that word, I, I don't think I ever heard that as being part of it. Um, for me, okay. First of all, it enters because I love, I love to try to, you know, bring some joy and some healing. That is, that is my work is love. It is, it comes from love. And I think that one of the parts of my own healing work, and I am still on this journey, and I actually think this journey goes past this lifetime, um, is to learn how to love even myself more. And, um, and that's part of what I'm hoping to do with clients, you know, um, the subjugated, because when you've been taught that you're not worthy and all of this, oh, I left out something else I didn't want to say, too, but anyway, um, it, 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 it's, it's hard. And, and part of loving yourself, at least in my experience, and this is what I try to, is the vulnerability. For me, it's coming to embrace, like, okay, all those messes I did tonight with the, with the slides, right? as an example, like, like, I'm okay, you know, I mean, I wish it hadn't happened, you know, but I don't, I don't feel like, oh, God, you know, it's like, that's love. That's love in a sense of saying, you know, 
my value is not determined by the fact that I get everything perfect that, you know, that I shine. The, my value is that hopefully something here was a benefit. And yes, I'm a human being. And that's the kind of loving attitude that I try to bring to clients because, because the, here's the thing, and this is what I didn't get to mention. So often, I, I, like I'm really take a position about this proving, this proving thing of proving ourselves, which I hypothesized came out of the being two and three times of, uh, as good as a way to overcome racism, um, which I understand perfectly. It was just a strategy that, you know, our, our ancestors, you know, came up with. But I feel like what it has created, like even this idea that the antidote to racism is excellence, I think that is such a subjugating idea. You know, excellence, it's the idea of excellence in the pursuit of proving that you are good enough. And I feel like that energy is not helpful. I feel like, because that's the thing that gets you like, okay, I gotta be, you know. And I think as long as that's what you're trying to be, look, the people that get through with their excellence will still tell you, most of them, that the, the stuff is still present. You know, they ha it opens up opportunities. But more than that to me is that it's a defensive position. It's like, okay, I got to prove this. And I think the more we can embrace our vulnerability and say, let's pursue what interests us, not because we're trying to, you know, prove that we're, you know, worth something. Let's just pursue it because, ah, we have that energy for it. And let's go out. And, and when you are interested in something, it's, it's a natural inclination, like to want to do it and to want to do it as well as you can. And to me, that's the energy of a joy you know, pursuing something out of a sense of joy, as opposed to, you know, I got to, I do this. And of course you don't say to yourself, this is not like, okay, I got to prove this to myself. Most people don't, but that energy, and you can, and I can tell, you can tell that energy. Our kids can tell that energy because when you're pushing them about how they got to get these grades, there's something else in the mix, man. And that something else is, I think, this proving stuff. So I, I connect that to love too, that Loving ourselves as, as people who are vulnerable like anybody else. And of course, I don't mean you have to share every vulnerability with anybody. Uh, that's not where I'm coming from. But I'm saying beginning to accept that about yourself and not, you know, you can hold yourself more. You can hold yourself more. Thank you. Um, this is a comment from someone. Uh, Dee, I love you so much. Thank you for being my teacher all those years ago. I will always consider you my teacher. Thank you for your strength and fearlessness and courage in demanding sacred spaces for family therapists of color. Thank you for being you, Ingrid. Oh my gosh. Hi, Ingrid. <laughs> oh, Ingrid Gomez? Uh, I only have Ingrid. Okay, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say I'm so proud of you too for running for office. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, um, well, there was a response. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what you have given us tonight uh, really embodies everything you said about what you want to do uh, with your work, with your voice. Uh, and I truly am appreciative and I've appreciated you over the years sh in sharing space with you and uh, being a, a beneficiary of your thinking and uh, wisdom. Uh, so I, um, along with others uh, who are appreciating you very much, am grateful uh, for this talk. I think we have another question. Let me just look. Uh, speaking of love, your lecture this evening feels like a gift of love. Thank you for sharing the wisdom on what has helped sustain you over the years. So uh, another uh, comment. And it truly has been a gift, uh, you know, and, and that uh, between give and take or when you give, you know, you also receive. Uh, and that's the kind of exchange. Uh, yes, that's that exactly how I feel. I feel it's a gift to me. To have people who are willing to receive, you know, what I'm offering, 
you know, and even that doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything I'm saying, but, you know, to, to even show up to be, to make yourself available. I mean, yeah, I mean, I actually, it, one of my versions of this talk, I actually said that I really think that we need to interrogate any dualism, you know, we need to interrogate, you know, um, there's, there can be space for more than one thing and each thing has its contribution to make. Yes. Are there any more uh, questions or comments? We have a comment in the, the Q&A box. Oh, uh, I read that one. Uh, and we have one um, that says, thanks, Dee, for continuing giving your powerful uh, gift. That's from Aquila. <laughs> Uh, it has FY. I don't know who that is. Uh, um, I saw her name come up somewhere in the chat. Oh, uh, Aquila. So I guess that that's that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Aquila. Okay, we had a lot of people on tonight who know you very well. Uh, you spent a long time at Acumen giving and um, they too have um, benefited from your gifts uh, there and tonight. Yeah, I'll just say one other thing. I, I'm working with some, some um, family therapists who are in, behind me in, in age and generation um, who have some really good creative work to, to share. And uh, I'm looking forward to that being available and to other people uh, work being available too. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, from Suzanne, you are a gift. Thank you. Um, from Prudencia Wood, uh, who I believe is from England, uh, said, Dear D, as one African heritage woman to another, you are an inspiration. Long may you continue to bless us. And then uh, we have another guest. Um, uh, I'm probably gonna butcher this name, but um, I'm not sure you need to know or you know, but thank you, you you give of yourself so deeply. And another thank you so much, Tandy Way, for this deeply loving offering. Thank you. And from Andrea, uh, or Andrea, thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, Tandy Way, I'm so glad to have been here tonight one of your former colleagues. Thank you for coming. I wanna to say to you, Marlena, the same is true for you that I've appreciated, you know, uh, our conversations as well. And uh, it, it's been very sustaining <laughs> to be able to have them. <laughs> and what about that Patricia Smith point? Had you ever yeah. heard? No, I had not. So uh, that was something, uh, you know, and uh, I, I had not read uh, Lupita's book. I knew that story of how she would pray and wish that she could be lighter, that she wanted to wake up, you know, uh, basically and be white. Um, yeah, I hadn't heard that story. I just, I, when I discovered the book, I was like, I bought an extra copy and I brought one and put it on the shelves at Ackerman. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought he's not it's so beautiful it's just so beautifully done but I figured that you know she was inspired to do it because of her dark skin yeah yeah I had read uh where she talked about that uh, but I uh, will absolutely order that book and uh give it to some folks that I know that would be wonderful yes uh you've left us with a lot uh of of gifts uh, your talk, uh, and I'm still uh, reflecting on, uh, I mean, of course, I knew what back talk was, but. Uh, <laughs> I figured you might, that's why I said a few people out there I know know about back talk. <laughs> you know, I, I guess I did a little of that myself, only I didn't frame it that way in some of the articles that I wrote. <laughs> yes. yes. But uh, yeah, but this is um, um, 
good. Uh, I, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, I might have some more back talk I need to <laughs> publish. <laughs> it's so healthy and you make it work for you. That's the beauty of it. You know, yes. you make it work and it becomes a much wider, it, it, it expands from that, whatever that particular thing is to, to a wider positive. Mm -hmm. uh, so. But you know, in talking about uh, notions of not being good enough, uh, not being scholarly enough. Uh, I mean, in the academy, you know that we are inundated with those kinds of things. And um, you already come in, especially if you're in a traditional white uh, institution, uh, feeling as if you are less than, uh, and not just feeling it, uh, being treated in that way uh, as if you are and so I greatly appreciated what you had to say about how uh, it, it doesn't require you to be uh, an academician to have a theory or, you know, to come up with something that is useful and, you know, um, and that's healing uh, for people. You know? Well, I think sometimes what, what happens is, you know, the, the privilege, like they, they want, they see themselves as so elite. And so they... I'll never forget this. When I uh, got into Duke to do my clinical psych work, they actually sent out to us before we came into the into the class the scores, the GRE scores of everybody in my, in my class, and uh, which I thought was so obnoxious, you know. I mean, you know, and some of them were through the roof, you know, and mine weren't bad, you know, mine were were good, but still. Like to me, things like that are meant to try to intimidate you. They're trying to say, we are so smart. And I think this is why I wanted to tackle because I even remember in that program, there were times when the, when the articles were terrible to read. And I just remember being so relieved when I finally, you know, there was an article by, you know, Donald Meekenbaum who was just coming on the scenes with his cognitive behavioral. And it was so clear. And I was thinking, oh, and then finally I realized these people can't write. They really can't write. And, yeah. and I'm not saying that some, some material is more complex and, and can be difficult to get through, but some of it, but there's this idea. It, it's always about trying to elevate, you know, oneself and, and intimidate. And um, absolutely. And the other piece of that that's unknown frequently is that uh, some people, though they don't write well, know others who are on those boards and they get their articles published. Yes, yes, yes. I learned that too. I learned that too. I was like, this article doesn't make sense. I was telling my, my faculty about it. This article doesn't make sense. And I'm thinking, how did this thing get published? And he said, it happens. <laughs> and so you learn, okay, just because it got published doesn't mean that it makes sense. So, you know, it, yeah, that's a big point that I want to make. And so we get intimidated. We get intimidated and then, you know, but this is why the collective is so important. In every white institu educational institution I went to, uh, except my first one in high school, um, that's, we organized, we organized, yeah. And, and the other point that you made, uh, which um, I think bears a lot of reflection and thinking for all of us uh, that, you know, it's going to take the subjugated and privileged selves to be engaged. And, and that means people, you know, uh, to be engaged in this work. And that it's okay for those um, of us who live subject in subjugated spaces most of the time to get rest and, and do some caretaking of ourselves. I think we have some more questions, so I'll stop filling up the space. Uh, I appreciate the idea of, of turning how we work into theories. How have you done it in your work? Any specific tips on how to do it in real time with clients? Appreciate you so much, Tandy Way, always. Thank you for expanding my heart and brain always. And that's from Amanda. Oh, Amanda. Ah, I appreciate Amanda in my class. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have much more to say about that. I mean, that's why I took so much time with that whole 
article of talking about my process of how, you know, once, once I recognized it was theory making, right? And I thought, you know, I, why is it such a mystery to me? You know, and I, like, I guess, as I said, because of my, my, how I tend to conceive of it. Um, but it's, what I was showing you was just a certain reasoning about my experience and my knowledge base, right? Um, and that it wasn't, it was like, okay, so why is this how, okay, so this guy says that shame, this, he gives me a definition and I say, oh, wow, that oppression is, is shaming. It's shamed us. Every, it's shamed all of us. It's like, and then I'm looking at, and I know we wouldn't talk about things that, you know, you know, we were shamed. And I don't even know that we ever articulated. We never even articulated that we were shamed, but we knew, we knew that, uh, I'll never forget my mother had this ugly plastic thing she put over her head whenever it rained and it was so unattractive. <laughs> but I mean, that's what you did. Um, and so then I just started thinking, why are some, why are black, and this is years after people started wearing their naturals, but even so, you still wouldn't get in a cross racial setting and talk about like how you, you know, used to feel like, you know, your hair was not, you know, good or attractive. And so what is happening? Why, why is this happening? And then, then you just start thinking. You start thinking of, well, how, what might it, why is it happening now? And how can we, and then I read, like I said, I read up on shame. You got to, you know, and then, well, it seems like if we want to do more of this, right? Like I think the Black Power Movement actually went directly to the primary shame. I mean, this was the brilliance. I love to say this. We didn't say brown is beautiful. We went all the way max. Black is beautiful because that's where it was at. You know, the shame was 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 started in Africa. That was the space of the shame, right? The dark continent, right? And and even to this day, Latin America, India, and in India. I don't know that it's. I I don't know my history, and uh, well enough to know that that the darkness in India has anything to do with African people. But, but I know in the book I was reading some time ago that, I don't know if this is still true, that, the, uh, that India is where the most bleaching cream, if you look at the, the amount of bleaching cream that gets sold across the globe. Um, so anyway, yeah, I think you just, you just start thinking about something um, thinking about in your practice, what, what allows somebody to make a move, right? A move that you think is a positive one, right? What do you think the factors that went into that? And then you start, you know, thinking about it. And then you start thinking about it with other people. You start thinking, is it, is it, is it happening there too? Is this maybe, you know, a thing that's going on? Or is there something missing in this other situation? Why they may not be? moving. Uh, I think you just open your mind up to thinking about something that is interesting to you and what may be, what may be involved in it. Clearly, I'm interested in undoing oppression. So if, if I'm into shame, if the shame thing comes to me on my plate, then I'm going to want to interrogate that. And I want to try to figure out what can, I, what can we do? Because we're not going to have another Black Power movement for a while. <laughs> So how else can we, how else can we begin to uh, try to get at this secondary shame so that we can then get back again to the primary shame? And the other thing I want to say about this is the imprint of this stuff is so deep. You know, uh, let me just use a quick example that has nothing to do with race. You know, I for a long time didn't think of God as masculine. And I, in my mind, it was clear, you know, but every time I said God, when I prayed, this masculine energy was present. You know, don't ask me how I could tell, but it, that's what it was. That's how I felt it. So then I started saying God and God, and this is my conscious mind is already clear, right? I've already come out of that masculine God but still in me, in me, this energy is, is coming up. And then I said, God and goddess. 
you know, because I said, you know, well, I'll get both the energies. I'll get the masculine and the, and then I just got tired of having to do both. And I, then I, for a while, I just said, dear Iris, in the sense of a flower, I just decided, you know, because in my spirituality, God is in everything. And so I can say, but my point there was that even though I was not no longer even thinking of God in, in, as a he, like I was still getting that energy just because of the association is deeper in my body than my conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have from Dory Mar. As a Puerto Rican brown woman raising a daughter, I grapple every day with managing ideas of back talk learned in my traditional Latino hetero family of origin. Appreciating my daughter's development of her woman voice, which she practices at home, and redefining ideas of respect has been a challenge. And she also says, I appreciate you and your sharing your ideas here. I'm not sure if there was something um, in that, that um, uh, other than just uh, making a comment. Thank you, Dior Mar. Um, yeah, I had to redefine respect as a parent. I mean, and I'm, I'm, you know, respect is a thing. You know, I think that's a cultural thing. I think that, I think we came here with that as a this cultural thing. When I say we, I mean, as an African people. Um, and I think it's important, um, but I think it's too, it was too narrowly defined. And I think children deserve respect. And, and that was not envisioned in patriarchy. <laughs> So I appreciate your, um, you know, your struggle to to find definitions um, that work that you think work more with what you have in mind, how you want it to be, Dory Ma. Okay, okay. Uh, well, thank you to all the uh, participants tonight, and most especially, uh, we owe a great deal of gratitude to Tandaway for sharing so much of the lessons that she has learned in her journey uh, uh, for personal healing, as well as, you know, uh, the practice of professional healing. Uh, we are truly uh, indebted to you for opening yourself up and giving us so much uh, tonight.